We have next up today Ryan uh, Bomberger, and Ryan is a creative professional. He is a citizen journalist, and he is co-founder of the Radiance Foundation. He and his wife, Bethany, co-founded the Radiance Foundation, which is an educational nonprofit organization dedicated to the belief that every human being has irreplaceable and intrinsic value. So it's my pleasure to welcome today Ryan. Thank you. Good morning. Everybody uh, wide awake? Okay, that didn't sound convincing, <laughs> but it's great to be here. I'm Ryan Bomberger, Chief Creative Officer of the Radiance Foundation, organization that my wife, Bethany, who's actually in here, right here, she's back there, just wave to her, my favorite person on the planet. Um, we love, if we can have the, the presentation up, that'd be great. We love illuminating uh, the truth, and it is up right above my head. This is what we do. We fight factophobia. Anybody know what factophobia is? It's probably self-explanatory. It's the fear of... Fear effect. Man, you're a good man. You're on the ball this early in the morning. See, we have, a, we have a country that says that we face all these kinds of phobias. You could probably fill in the blank with what kind of phobias supposedly we face, but there is a real and present dangerous phobia that has infected not just our mainstream media, which we love to affectionately call what? Fake news. Yes. It's infected our institutions of higher learning, which I wonder what they really mean by higher sometimes. And we also have our churches that have been infected with this. And the, the sad thing is there is brokenness and, that results from the unwillingness of Christians to engage and to speak the truth. As you can see underneath, it says, truth ain't hate. Let love illuminate. Just say it with me. Say, truth ain't hate. Truth ain't hate. Let love illuminate. So this is what we do. I consider myself a factivist. In case you don't know what that is, this might explain a little bit. Planned Parenthood does not at all profit from fetal tissue donation. Planned Parenthood has been involved in selling the body parts of the babies that they abort for, for decades now at this point. Thank God for David Delight and Sandra Merritt, who were courageous enough to actually do the job of mainstream media, something called journalism. And I'm really grateful for them. They're factivists. I'm a factivist. And hopefully you will consider yourself a factivist too. But I want to talk to you just briefly about <clears throat> the social injustice of abortion. And there's so many different avenues you can go when you talk about this, but I'm just going to raise a few questions. When we talk about social injustice, oftentimes on college campuses, I, I've been able to speak different places like Harvard and Princeton. It's amazing. They talk about social justice, but yet the issue of the killing of innocent life never seems to come up. And yet it is the most violent form of social injustice. So when we talk about social injustice of abortion, I have to ask the question, what about human rights? Because that's always the question. And I have to find it interesting. There's an organization that you may be familiar with that um, is deeply religious. Uh, it's located in New York City. And when I say deeply religious, I don't mean in a spiritual sense, but deeply religious about its secularism. But uh, you may fami be familiar with it, the United Nations. Anybody ever hear of it? <laughs> the United Nations, you know, it's not exactly considered a, a right-wing organization, but yet they have these powerful pro-life statements that are embedded in their founding documents. If you look at the UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was passed in 1948, as a result of which horrific event in history? World War II, the Holocaust. And so what is so powerful, if you read the UN Declaration of Human Rights and the preamble, it says, considering that in accordance with the principles proclaimed in the Charter of the United Nations, recognition of the inherent dignity, and I just want to pause there for a moment, <coughs> inherent. When does inherent begin? Conception. At conception. When you begin, when you exist. Inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. And I love this. In Article 3, in this, this founding document, charter document, it says, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. Everyone. They don't play the game of semantics, every person, because every human being is a person, regardless of age and stage. But then there's another document from the UN powerfully pro-life. And this is why non-governmental organizations, NGOs, want so desperately to change some of this wording, want so desperately to cast abortion as a human right. But yet, 
the founding document from one of the many founding documents of the UN uh, gives a whole different perspective. You look at the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was uh, passed in 1959 and then reaffirmed in 1989. I love these words. It says in this convention, in this document, quote, bearing in mind that as indicated in the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, the child by reason of his physical and mental immaturity needs special safeguards and care, including appropriate legal protection before as well as after birth. That's the UN. It's not a right to life group. It's not Americans United for Life. It's the UN. And that's why they have this dissonance where you have so many pushing for abortion as a human right. And then I have to ask the question, well, what about women's rights? Interesting, because if you go to founding feminists, not the feminists of the, the faux feminists of the women's march, they don't really qualify as founding feminists. But when you go to true feminism, like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I, I, I find this fascinating. If you go to their periodical that was called The Revolution, in it, they specifically say abortion is child murder. These are founding feminists. So today's so-called feminists can learn a lot from our founding feminists. This is the take they had. But yet you had someone like Margaret Sanger, who's touted all the time as you know, leading feminists and the mother of the birth control crusade, the mother of Planned Parenthood. Margaret Sanger, proof positive that when you, when you grow up in brokenness, you have cho choices throughout your life, whether you continue on in that brokenness or whether you break out of that. And she never did. Her solution to brokenness in the world was to eliminate the broken people or to eliminate those that she thought would become broken. And it's interesting because she is touted all the time as the savior of women because of birth control. And this, she was, she was a brilliant individual. She was duplicitous. She would say one thing, of course, in private, and then she'd say a different thing in public. But it's interesting. If you read her books, you can't really take anything that she says out of context. People will say, particularly those who defend uh, Margaret Sanger and defend Planned Parenthood, Oh, but these are, these are things, you, you, you take them out of context. No, I don't know how you take this out of context. She's defining what birth control is. And she says, birth control itself, often denounced as a violation of natural law, is nothing more or less than the facilitation of the process of weeding out the unfit, of preventing the birth of defectives or of those who will become defective. And it's amazing because that, that would include a whole you know, large group of individuals, they would write off certain groups, those who were born out of wedlock, those who were incarcerated, those who were physically uh, disabled in some way. And then they have this category called feeble-minded, which quite honestly, I personally think would include some of Congress or most of Congress today, but that's <laughs> a whole different thing. And it's interesting because you had that particular worldview, which people say, well, that was the dominant worldview at that time. Well, no. There were competing worldviews. Not everyone was a racist during the early part of the 20th century or throughout it. It's completely untrue. And what I find fascinating is that there are individuals that many people don't even know about who embodied true feminism. And here's one individual who truly did, Dr. Mildred Jefferson. It is unconscionably unfair that the victim selected on which to test the social remedy of expendable lives is the most defenseless member of the human family, the unborn child who cannot escape, cannot riot in the streets, and cannot vote. As a woman, I am ashamed that the voices raised loudest in this demand to destroy the unborn children are those of other women. Good hand clap for the late Dr. Mildred Jefferson, someone that everyone should know. Every school should be teaching, she should be in history books, but we know how history books go. And then you have to ask yourself the question when you talk about the social injustice of abortion, what about your rights? Why does Planned Parenthood spend millions of dollars defeating every single effort to inform women? All the women's right to know bills, all the uh, notification or consent, parental notification and consent, uh, waiting periods, they fight on every level to prevent information because they don't trust women enough with the truth. They don't trust the public enough with the truth. All they keep doing is, you know, this game of deflection. Abortion is only 3% of our services. Anybody ever hear that? 3% of our services, right? Which is interesting because then they say, but look at all the other things that we do. Just to kind of put this into context, 
I don't care what business you are, if 3% of the time you're killing human beings, uh, it's always wrong. I don't care if it's 0.00003% of the time. But yet they get away with this. And the mainstream media always touts all these other services as if, it, I guess it comes down to no seeming amount of beneficence makes up for the fact that you're killing human beings 3% of the time. In fact, according to their last annual report, they killed 321,384 precious human beings. And yet, mainstream media, which you know they're supposed to report and let us decide, or perhaps that's only um, one network's <laughs> slogan, but certainly doesn't apply to all mainstream media. But we actually do this. In fact, you can go online, and this is great for those who want to feel equipped and help to inform others. They're great. There's great content that you can go to if you go to Radiance.life and sharing the fact sheets and the memes, but this is one of them. We actually looked at all the services that Planned Parenthood provides, and every single major medical service to women has been plummeting at Planned Parenthood. As you can see here, uh, breast cancer screenings, which they're always talking about, they're down 62%. Pap tests down 72%. Prenatal care, which barely even exists, down 30%. And actually, uh, since um, 2000, I'm sorry, since 2009, it's down 81%. I mean, just plummeting. But shouldn't, shouldn't the mainstream media be concerned at all that all these major medical services to an organization that receives half a billion dollars of taxpayer money every year, shouldn't they be concerned about that? But see, they don't trust us enough. Apparently, we don't have the right to know these things. And as a parent of four, four awesome kiddos, I'm concerned about Planned Parenthood's presence in schools. We have some great fact sheets that are called 10 top, uh, top 10 Reasons to Keep Planned Parenthood Out of Your Local School. Of course, the number one reason being they kill human beings. But the other nine reasons are ones that should deeply concern uh, any parent, even someone who perhaps, disturbingly, is not moved enough by reason number one. But there are a lot of different reasons why. For instance, they promote promiscuity. On their t teen Tumblr page where they're asked, is it wrong to be promiscuous? Planned Parenthood's response is there's uh, the number of sexual partners you, you have doesn't say anything about your morals, about your personality, about your character, really. There's nothing bad or unhealthy about having a big number of sexual partners. Apparently, they've never heard of STDs or unintended pregnancies. But this is what happens when you, half a billion dollars goes to an unaccountable organization. So apparently, our rights don't matter. Then I have to ask the question, which this is always the comfortable one, what about racism? See, an organization that was birthed in eugenic racism and elitism, Planned Parenthood, which never severed uh, itself from its, its own DNA. They still celebrate Marcus Sanger, who was the leading eugenicist. They still celebrate every day. But this is interesting. When you ask the question, what about racism? One of the recent tweets from Planned Parenthood just says it all. It says, if you're a black woman in America, it's statistically safer to have an abortion than to carry a pregnancy to term or give birth. Could you imagine if President Trump tweeted that? What kind of response do you think there would have been? I mean, you would have people, white supremacy and racism, racism, but because Planned Parenthood tweets something like this, silence. Silence from mainstream media. What is the ultimate end of racism? Throughout American history, the ultimate end was death. Abortion is death. And in the black community, it happens five times higher. In New York City, where uh, Planned Parenthood was birthed, more black babies are aborted than born alive. For every 1,000 born alive, 1,101 are aborted. The only demographic where there is more induced deaths than births. And yet people call this reproductive justice. And that's why when we first started our organization, whew, we decided we were going to take the, the two easiest topics, race and abortion, and combine them in a <laughs> billboard campaign in Atlanta, working with Katherine Davis and Georgia Right to Life. And we placed billboards, um, 80 billboards, and dealt with this head on first public ad campaign dealing with abortions, hugely disproportionate impact in the black community. And well, you'll get a, an idea of the billboards that we placed. Let's just say the reaction was insane. There was a media frenzy. I mean, New York Times you know, put out an article, and then it was everywhere. Probably the most uh, media-covered pro-life billboard campaign ever. 
out there. And it was interesting because they didn't know how to handle me. I didn't fit their narrative. Brown guy, pro-life, adopted, and they tried to demonize me as much as they could. In fact, I'll never forget there was an NPR uh, story done, and they were interviewing me offline, and it was such a long interview, and I kept feeling like they're trying to find something. They're digging to find something to demonize me. 45 minutes in this interview, then the show called All Things Considered, which apparently didn't consider the truth to be part of the program, had a three minute and 27 second program that omitted, it was about the, the campaign. I designed the campaign organization, released it, omitted me entirely <laughs> from the, the news story about the campaign. But this is what fake news does all the time. But it was such a powerful learning lesson. And we just have to understand as factivists, we can circumvent mainstream media. We have the power of social media, even though there are times that Twitter tries to censor us and ban us and Facebook does the same because, you know, I love when the self-proclaimed deities of diversity show zero tolerance for ideological diversity. But you keep on fighting. In fact, we're fighting again. We're getting ready to release some billboards and we're dealing with, um, for instance, in Ohio, the, the state's largest abortion facility called Preterm placed 16 billboards throughout Cleveland, which is predominantly black, 52% black. Put up billboards that said abortion is, and then there's a fill in the blank. Abortion is sacred. Abortion is a blessing. Abortion is necessary. Abortion is justice. Kind of makes your blood boil. And so we're responding with a series of billboards, but this is one of them. This is what abortion is. Abortion is systemic racism. Someblacklivesmatter.com. Taking on the whole Black Lives Matter movement, which announced solidarity. I mean, you can't proclaim that Black Lives Matter and then partner with the leading killer of black lives. They announced solidarity with Planned Parenthood. So we're just calling them out. And this is what we have to do. We don't have the luxury of being silent. So when I talk about the social injustice of abortion, there are many issues that are inextricably tied to it. But it doesn't matter what those issues are if we choose to be silent about the most prevalent form of injustice in our society today. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, before you leave, if people want to connect with you on social media, what's the best way to connect with you? Radiance.life, www.radiance.life. And we'd love to hear from you. You can see all the original content that we create, videos, the memes, print, stuff to equip you to engage in these tough conversations. Excellent. Well, for those of us who are in the trenches, and that is everybody who is on our online audience right now, because we are all grassroots activists, what an encouragement to hear what you and your wife Bethany are doing. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's a joy to be here. God bless.